So this is a pre-class lecture for Monday, September 24th. So we've been talking about uh, cyclic alkanes uh, last Wednesday, talking about naming, and then on Friday, talking about conformations of cyclohexanes. The last uh, bit in Chapter 3 is to talk about when you fuse rings together and, and form what are called bicyclic compounds. And so in the in bicyclic compounds, we're going to take some rings and we're going to fuse these together. So for instance, if I look at this molecule, I'm actually, if you look at this molecule, it actually has two five-membered rings that are fused together. There's the first ring. And then here's the second ring. And they share one, two, three carbons in common. So these are two fused um, five-membered rings. This structure is actually a molecule called camphor. Now, you'd think that fusing, fusing rings together because these have these weird shapes that they're that these molecules are pretty rare and actually they're not. Um, if you've used a perfume or a cologne, you most likely have smelled compounds that are fused together. Um, and these bicyclic compounds actually occur quite a bit in different natural compounds. Um, the and they're sometimes these are called terpenes and they're found in essential oils and fragrances. So in certain essential oils, you'll find a lot of these, um, and certainly in perfumes and actually even in sodas, you'll find some of these compounds that are the flavoring or the, the uh, fragrance, fragrant ingredients. So camphor is one found in pine needles um, and other, and other it's, there's actually a certain type of cinnamon that has a little bit of camphor in it that differentiates it from other types of cinnamons. Uh, there's these thing, these pinenes that it basically have a one, two, three, they've got a one, two, three, four, five membered ring fused to a one, two, three, four, five, six membered ring. Uh, there's different pinenes. There's alpha pinene. There's beta pinene. Um, and then camphene is sort of related to camphor, and there's actually another molecule called borneol and isoborneol, where this carbonyl group has been reduced down to an alcohol. So the idea is when you see these fused systems, they are quite abundant in nature. Um, and the question is, the book goes into how do you name these? And there's a certain template that you use for naming bicyclics. Basically, it is that you take and you'll have bicyclo in the name, you'll have three numbers in brackets separated by per periods, then you'll have a prefix and ANE. Now the prefix is going to refer to the total number of carbons in the fused in the fused ring system. And then these numbers are going to actually refer to the sort of the sizes, and I'll put that in quotes, of the rings. So for instance, this, if we were going to name this molecule, and this is an example from your textbook, I would see that this has six carbons plus two. So this is going to be an octane. And then, in order to get the numbering scheme, we actually it would say bicyclo to begin with. So to get the three numbers in the brackets, what we do is we actually count this part of the ring system, and then this part of the ring system, and then this one doesn't have a third part of the ring system. It doesn't have. Uh, it only has these two fused. It has two rings fused together, but only sharing two carbons. And so therefore, it actually does not have a third part. So this, there are four carbons here, two carbons here, and then zero carbons on the third part. So this is called bicyclo-4-2-O-octane. 
if you look at this one, this has one, two, three, four, five, then six, seven, eight. So this is going to be another bicyclo octane. Only in this case now, if these are my two fused carbons, I've got one carbon here, I've got two carbons here, and I've got three carbons there. So this would be a bicyclo three, two, one octane. What would be the name of this molecule? If you're overly ambitious, stop the tape and try and name it. It's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is another bicyclo octane. Here's my two fused carbons. I've got two carbons there, two carbons here, two carbons here. So this is bicyclo 2, 2, 2 octane. Okay, so it's relatively straightforward template for naming just the bicyclic system. It becomes a little bit more complicated when you try and add if there are functional groups that are on it. But then this is the basic template. The last topic that they they discuss in chapter three, but they don't give you a sense of why it's important, are these molecules called decalins. A decalin would be two fused six-membered rings together that share two carbon two compounds or two carbons. So they would have a six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I suppose if I was going to name this, I would call this a bicyclo decane, hence the decalin name, and I have one, two, three, four carbons on each side, so this would be a bicycle of 4.4.0 dec decane. But it turns out for decalins that there's two different isomers that you can form, and these would be in the generic term geometric isomers because they're not interconvertible. And that is at the fusion point of these two carbons, you end up, you can either have sort of these hydrogens in the, that are at the fusion points either be trans to each other and you form transdecalin, or you can have these two hydrogens cis to each other, which would make the molecule cisdecalin. And on, if you look at the flat structures like this, and again, the bold wedge is pointing towards you, the dashed wedge is pointing away from you, but you don't get a real sense as to the shape difference that you get between trans and cisdecalin. So if you were to look at the transdecalin, you would have these two hydrogens right here that are um, trans to each other. These are what the textbook actually calls, this is called a, a bridgehead carbon. And you could study these systems in a lot more detail than than we're going to even talk about. But the, for the bridgehead carbon, you could have the two hydrogens then trans or cis. Well, transdecalin looks like two chair cyclohexanes that are fused together. But the cisdecalin is a whole other story. The cisdecalin, with these two hydrogens being cis to each other, the two cyclohexane rings are actually going to be sort of skewed to each other. They're not a simple uh, fusion like they are in transdecalin. And if I asked you which one of these two structures you thought was more stable, you of course would say the transdecalin, because in the case of the cisdecalin, you now have some pretty significant 1-3 diaxial interactions here that you would have to overcome in order to form that cisdecalin. But they do form cisdecalin and transdecalins are actually quite common. And the one thing that the book doesn't tell you is it doesn't tell you why. Why, why do I even care about decalins? I mean, why do I care about organic chemistry? Well, most people, it's like, I have to. But where are these relevant? So where they become relevant is, are in molecules that are called steroids. And I'm not talking about the steroids that, you know, make you huge, like anabolic steroids. I'm just talking about the generic class of steroids, although those are some. 
uh, estrogen, and estro estrogen and testosterone are both steroids. Um, if you take hydrocortisone, if you put that on your skin, that's a steroid. So the generic structure of steroids is actually a series of fused six-membered rings and then a five-membered ring that's also fused. This is sort of the generic structure of a steroid, and sometimes people don't talk about the A and the B and the C and the D ring. But the key thing about this generic structure of the steroid is that where the six and five membered rings are fused, you normally have a trans, which means you're going to have the six and five membered rings being in that stable um, sort of chair conformation. This would be a chair and envelope conformation. If you look over here between these two fused rings, these two hydrogens are trans, so you've got those two rings that are fused together as two chairs, and so that's the cis decalin type uh, piece. But then when you get down here between the A and the B ring, you can actually have this hydrogen either be cis or trans to the other hydrogen that's up here at the fusion point. And so you can imagine that in a steroid where the all of this hydrogens are trans to each other, that you're just going to have a series of cyclohexane rings that are fused together in a relatively what we would call planar molecule. I mean, it's going to, it's, there's not going to be much shape. It's just going to be kind of flat. And an example of one where we have a, a different structure is in cholic acid, which is a bile acid. What you actually see is you do have a transfusion here. You've got a transfusion on these two hydrogens, but then here, you've actually got the cis fusion. And so between this A and B ring, what you actually have is the transdecalin. Now that's going to completely change the shape of this steroid. And as we'll learn here in a few weeks, the shapes of organic molecules are extremely important as to how they react. You may get some sense of that from your biology classes where you may have talked about things like lock and key models or enzymes where the certain shape of the molecule fits just perfectly in things like receptors and other, you know, and other biological molecules. Well, when you have a cis fusion between your A and B ring of your um, steroid, that's going to change the structure quite dramatically. So here would be kind of the structure of cholic acid, and what you can see is you can see your sort of cis or I'm sorry, your sort of trans decalin type fusion here to allow the six membered rings to be, you know, fairly planar. But then over here you see your cis fusion, sort of like the cis decalin. And then down here you see kind of a ball and stick model, and it's noisy because it's hard to see through the hydrogens. But you can kind of see here are those two hydrogens right here of the cis fusion. And then over here, these two hydrogens are the ones of the transdecalin. So for cholic acid, this particular shape of the molecule, in addition to the functional groups that it has attached, make this molecule you know, do whatever it is that it does uh, biologically. So cis and transdecalins are actually important topics. And they're important here, for instance, in forming different shapes for the different steroids, which will play a role in their functions, in how they react in biochemical systems. Okay, so that's the end of chapter three, um, dealing and dealing here with the fused systems. Now, in chapter four, we're going to talk a lot about free radical halogenation, and this is going to be the first mechanism or first reaction that we really get into the gory detail about how the reaction occurs step by step, which are what are called mechanisms. So we're going to have to remember a little bit about general chemistry. We're going to have to remember about activation energy and um, kinetics and writing kinetic equations. And so this is the first sort of reaction that we'll talk about. Now, for the most part, alkanes, if you have, let's say, ethane, so CH3, CH3. We already talked about one reaction of, of alkanes, 
which is basically to react them with oxygen gas in, with either a spark or a flame and to combust them, burn them to form CO2 and water. And while that's a really important reaction for alkanes, it's not necessarily um, the best for synthetic organic chemists who are interested in turning molecules into bigger ones, to make bigger and bigger molecules so that we can make plastics or drugs or whatever that we're going to make. So combustion is important. I mean, without this, we don't drive cars, we don't heat our houses, we don't burn wood without these combustion reactions. But the more synthetically important reaction is to take something like methane and to react it with a halogen. So generically, we would say X2. That could be chlorine. That could be bromine. Um, those are the main two halogens we're going to talk about. Fluorine tends to react really explosively with alkanes, and so we kind of keep the fluorine gas away from those. And iodine turns out to be unreactive. So I'm going to spend, or we're going to spend most of our time talking about bromine and chlorine reacting with alkanes. And so when this happens, what we end up doing is we end up doing what's called free radical halogenation, which is, turns out to be a substitution reaction. I'm going to rewrite this structure so we can kind of see what happens. If I write the Lewis dot structure of methane out like this, and I react it with chlorine gas, what's going to happen is I'm going to do substitution where I'm going to substitute for a hydrogen a halogen. So the hydrogen and the halogen are going to swap places. So that means as my final product, I'm going to end up with a chlorine there, and then the HCl is the other product. Okay, this product is called an alkyl chloride. And common names for these alkyl chlorides are simply naming the alkyl group attached to the chlorine or the bromine. So this would be called methyl chloride. Or it could also be called chloromethane. But the idea is that these are substitution reactions. I'm going to substitute a hydrogen for a halogen. And then later on, by the end of the by the end of the semester, you'll see that once I replace this hydrogen with a chlorine, I could then turn around and replace the chlorine with an OH group or a C triple bond end or some other functional group. So this is what this substitution reaction is what takes a relatively non-reactive alkane and lets us put functional groups within it. And that's what this substitution reaction is. So this is called free radical halogenation. And the free radical part deals with the mechanism by which this reaction un is undergoes. And I'm going to talk about the mechanism today, and then we're going to talk a lot more about it in the lectures to come. So this is from your textbook. And what we're going to deal with with this reaction is we're going to talk about mechanisms. So what is a mechanism? A reaction mechanism is a complete step-by-step -step description of exactly what happens in the reaction. Chemical reactions involve breaking bonds and making bonds. And so how are those bonds broken? How are those bonds made? And that's what the mechanism is. It tells us step-by-step -step how you get from reactant to products, sometimes in exceptionally gory detail. Along the way, we have to, in order to have a mechanism, we have to study the thermodynamics of the system. We need to talk about entropy changes. We need to talk about enthalpy changes. We need to look at the stability of the reactants relative to the products. We get into things like equilibrium. So thermodynamics is used to study mechanisms. And then, of course, kinetics comes into play. And this you may or may not remember from general chemistry, the idea that kinetics can tell us about mechanisms. 
and we have things like rate determining steps and activation energy, the Arrhenius equation, all sorts of things that go into that, into those reactions. So in general what happens is that people collect a lot of experimental data and then they propose a mechanism. And then they do other experiments to try and either prove their mechanism is correct or in the best case scenario they actually try and do experiments that would destroy their mechanism and in the end if you've done all the experiments possible and your mechanism still stands then it's probably correct and that's my my PhD advisor used to say that that you know if you're not if you're not going to test your own mechanism or you're not going to try and destroy your own mechanism then other people certainly will and so it'd be better if you understood whether your mechanism you know will fail under certain conditions better that you know that than you know the guy who's trying to to destroy your your mechanism that you've just proposed and ultimately then mechanisms are never totally proven um, they become accepted and that's what we learn in the textbook now for chlorination there's been a lot of experimental evidence done. We'll sh I'll show you the mechanism that's accepted in a moment. But here are some of the observations that people made along the way. What they found was that when they mixed something like methane and chlorine gas, that the reaction didn't occur at room temperature in the dark. So you need light or you need heat in order to get this reaction to go okay and so there has to be some sort of energy that's used to initiate it well heat you know we heat reactions all the time but rarely do we have reactions that you know wouldn't go in the dark but they would go in the presence of light so this is a sort of a new feature and when people studied that the reaction would occur or needs light to occur they then studied what the most effective wavelength of the light would be and they found that the wavelength of light was in the blue color and that just so happens to be the same color of light or the same energy of photon that is very strongly absorbed by the chlorine gas and so the idea here is that if the wave the best wavelength of light to make the reaction occur is the same wavelength of light that's strongly absorbed by the chlorine gas, then it must be something about the light interacting with the chlorine gas that causes the reaction to occur. Okay, that's another observation. And then the third observation is that the light, what they say in your textbook, is the light initiated reaction has a high quantum yield. Well, what does that mean? That means that basically one photon of light produces a lot of product, a lot of molecules of product. It's not a simple stoichiometric one photon, one product. There's lots of products that are formed from a single photon. And so our mechanism, whatever mechanism that people propose, has to basically be supported by these three observations. Okay. And so the mechanism that's, that is accepted for free radical halogenation is this. It occurs by three sets of steps. The first set of steps is what we call initiation. And so in the initiation step what happens is, is that chlorine gas, diatomic chlorine molecules, react with light, which I'm going to call H nu, for a photon of light, and these two chlorine atoms are split apart homogeneously. And what that means is that means that when these, this bond is broken, I'm going to end up with two chlorine atoms. So I'm going to end up with two chlorines with unpaired electrons. I'm going to cleave this bond what we call homolytically. Now what I mean by that is that when I split this bond, each atom gets an electron. There's no electronegativity difference between the chlorine atoms, so there's no reason for one to get both electrons over the other. And so they just basically 
brought two electrons together to form the bond. They're now splitting up and each taking its electron with it. Now how we show that is by using the arrows. Before we talked about using curved arrows with a full head on them in order to show the movement of two electrons. What I'm going to show in this case is an, elect is an arrow that only has half a head and that's going to indicate the movement of a single electron. And so if I'm looking at this bond, I could write half arrows. And the book calls these things fish hooks. I'm not big on that. But they show we show a half arrow where that means that the chlorine gets one electron and the other chlorine gets one electron. And we form our two chlorine atoms. Okay, and this initiates the process of free radical halogenation. Once we initiate the process, then we go into what are called propagation steps. And there are two propagation steps. What we find is that the chlorine atoms will react with a hydrogen on methane. And they will end up and that will end up forming HCl and a carbon that has an unpaired electron. Okay, a lot, to, a lot to talk about in this step. First of all, here's what happens. The carbon-hydrogen bond breaks. The hydrogen takes its one electron and pairs it up with the chlorine, one electron. That forms then the HCl bond. And then this carbon then retains its one electron to form then that unpaired electron or to have an unpaired electron on the carbon. Okay, so this is how the half arrows would work. Now let's take a minute to talk about this species. Here is a carbon that has an unpaired electron and it's got two, four, six, seven total electrons that it's sharing. This is what's called a radical. It's called a carbon radical. And so radical refers to the idea of carbon having an unpaired electron. Notice that the carbon has no charge. If you calculated its formal charge, it came with four electrons. It now owns four electrons. Is this radical a stable species? Well, you could probably make the case that most radicals, not necessarily in chemistry uh, are probably not necessarily all that stable but in chemistry radicals are unstable because they only have seven valence electrons that carbon would love to pick up an a second electron to give it eight to obey the octet rule and that's coming it will actually get to eight to a valence um, number of valence electrons of eight so we'll talk a minute about we'll talk about this structure um, in a couple of minutes or we'll wait until Wednesday to talk about this. But here's your unpaired electron. This is a radical. Okay, so then in the second propagation step, and I'm just going to simply reverse the bonds and put my unpaired electron here, I'm going to react that now with an intact molecule of chlorine gas. Now what's known is that actually the initiation step is it occurs very um, slowly. In other words, you might have just 0.1% of the chlorine molecules dissociate into the chlorine atoms. You might want to say, why don't you call these chlorine radicals? And I, and I use the term interchangeably, but these are actually free chlorine atoms. So if you have just a small portion of the chlorines dissociating, you're going to have most of the chlorine still in its diatomic molecular state. And so what is happens next in this process is that the carbon radical reacts with the chlorine gas. So what happens is, is that the chlorine-chlorine bond breaks and 
that carbon unpaired electron pairs up with the chlorine's unpaired electron to form a carbon chlorine bond and then this chlorine retains its unpaired electron and remains as a chlorine atom. So here's my product. Here's my free radical product. And notice that if we look at the initiation and the propagation steps, this actually fits one of our observations. Well, it fits a couple of observations that we saw a few minutes ago. Number one, that this mechanism is initiated by the dissociation of chlorine, which occurs either by reacting with a photon or by heating. And if you look at this process overall, every time you form a chlorine atom, after it goes the, through these two steps, you make a molecule of product, but then you make another chlorine atom. And so that chlorine atom then comes back over here and starts the process again. And that fits the observation that if you have a very low percentage of chlorine atoms that are formed, you still get a high reaction or high product yield because one chlorine atom that's formed produces another chlorine and this just continually propagates. One chlorine atom propagates another. And so that high quantum yield that your textbook talks about, this is exactly um, what you would see in this mechanism. Remember, this mechanism is being proposed on those experimental observations. Okay, so this propagation process occurs over and over and over and over again, but when does it stop? Well, first it could stop when you run out of stuff. Okay, if you run out of the methane or you run out of chlorine, then the reaction is going to stop. But it there are also three reactions that could stop the reaction, and these are called termination steps. And so the termination steps are basically going to be that I'm going to react two species with unpaired electrons together, and that's going to form a neutral molecule and stop the reaction, stop the formation of the radicals. So here's the first possible termination step. Two chlorine atoms pair up their unpaired electrons to form a chlorine molecule. That's the first termination step. Or a chlorine atom happens to come in contact with a carbon radical And in that case, you're going to have those two unpaired electrons form a carbon-chlorine bond. And then the third possibility, which would form a new product, is that what would happen if you had two methyl radicals, and that's what these are called, what if you had two methyl radicals come in contact with each other and each donate one electron? You would actually form a new product. You would form ethane. Now, if you're thinking in terms of proving this mechanism, if I write this mechanism out and I get this coupling, or I get this final termination step, which is actually called a coupling reaction, then I should see in my product some ethane. A lot of ethane? Probably not, but I should see some. And so for this mechanism to be valid, I would want to look for the formation of that coupling product. And if I see it, it, it supports this mechanism. If I don't see it, then it basically can help kind of, cha I'm going to have to change my mechanism to account for the fact that I don't see those two
that I don't see that sort of side product. Okay, and so people have seen these coupling products being formed, and so therefore it provided mechanism, it provided evidence to support this six-step mechanism. So we have initiation, propagation, and then termination as our steps. Now, are you going to have to write these steps? Absolutely. But let's take a minute to, to sort of step back here and talk about this mechanism and a couple more features of it. In general chemistry, you talked about the idea of intermediates in reaction mechanisms. I know that was a long time ago, so we probably need a quick refresher on what an intermediate is. Well, intermediates are basically species that are formed during the reaction but are not products or reactants. Now, I like to define intermediates in terms of where you find them in a mechanism. Let's say that I had molecule A and B react together to form molecule C, but then C decomposes to form molecules D and E. So these are my two steps of my proposed mechanism for a reaction. C would be my intermediate because the intermediate then is produced in one step of the mechanism but consumed in another step of the mechanism so that when I add up my mechanistic steps, or what Chang would have called your elementary steps, you would get A and B react together to form products D and E. These are intermediates are produced in one step of the mechanism, consumed in the other, but do not show up in the overall reaction. That would be sort of my definition of intermediates. Okay. So let's go back to our reaction and talk about what are intermediates in this reaction. I see two intermediates on this page. Can you tell me what they are? If you're shouting chlorine at the screen, why are you doing that? But you're correct. If you said that the alk that the methyl radical was an intermediate, you're also correct. So the species with unpaired electrons are intermediates in this reaction. And mechanistically, people who study reaction mechanisms one of the burdens that they have if they're going to propose a mechanism is that they actually have to show evidence supporting the formation of an intermediate. If not, capture the intermediate and put it in a bottle and study it. Okay, and There's two flavors really of organic chemists. There's those that are do synthetic chemists. Synthetic chemistry, in other words, they just want to make molecules and they could care less how the reactions occur. Um, there are those that are physical, physical organic chemists who study the mechanisms by which reactions occur. That's kind of a combination of organic chemistry and physical chemistry, which is not exactly the best combination to have. Um, I happen to have been trained as a physical organic chemist to study reaction mechanisms. So in my research, that deals with purely physical organic chemistry, we look for intermediates and we try and determine their structures and what kinds of reactions the intermediates undergo. Okay. 
So chlorine, the chlorine atom and the methyl radical are both intermediates in this reaction. Intermediates can actually be studied. They have the possibility of being isolated. That means being put in a jar to study. Sometimes intermediates are so unstable that we can't study them directly, but the difference between an intermediate and the next thing I'm going to talk about, which is called a transition state, is that intermediates do have the possibility of being isolated, and intermediates are more stable than these things called transition states. So the other part, the other terminology that we have to talk about with a mechanism is what we call transition states. Transition states are very unstable. And they only occur for a fleeting second. They, a transition state cannot be isolated. So you cannot take a transition state and throw it into a bottle and study it. Transition states are very unstable. But other than that, what is a transition state? Transition states are going to be the high energy species, right? Hence the instability or instability. They're high energy species that form when bonds are broken and or made. That's what a transition state is. If you're plotting energy versus reaction, what we call a reaction coordinate diagram, versus reaction progress. Normally I would say, here's my reactants, and they're going to go and form products. I'm going to have the energy of the system go up until it reaches a peak and then it's going to go down to form the products. Okay, these reaction coordinate diagrams we will spend an awful lot of time drawing, at least in the next chapter. So reactants go to products. From general chemistry, do you remember what this is? That's called Ea. That is your activation energy. This peak is our transition state. Or sometimes in the Chang book, they called it an activated complex. I'm going to talk about the transition state um, because that's what we traditionally use in organic chemistry. So the high energy species here at the top of the reaction coordinate diagram is the transition state. And so in general chemistry, when you talk about the activation necessary, you're talking about the activation that's necessary to get to the transition state. Okay, so comparing and contrasting, transition states are unstable and they can't be isolated. But intermediates are also not particularly stable, but they do have the possibility of being isolated. Now, the reaction coordinate diagram that I've drawn out here as an example is a reaction, it would be for a reaction where we go directly from reactants to products with just a single transition state. If you have an intermediate in the reaction, you go from, again, this is our energy and this is our reaction progress. We go from reactants 
through a transition state to a high energy species through another transition state and then down to our products. This would be what we would see for what we call a reaction coordinate diagram for a reaction that has one intermediate. So these two positions, the peaks, are our transition states. Here and here. This valley in between the transition states, which is still a high energy species, but not as unstable as the transition states, this valley here, that is where we would find our intermediate. And so I have to define these terms because in subsequent lectures, we're going to use these diagrams to explain more about what happens in the free radical halogenation reaction. And we need to know what a transition state is, and we need to know what an intermediate is, and we need to know where to find those on our reaction coordinate diagram. So, so far, we have intermediates, we have transition states. So if I go back here to my initiation step and propagation steps, I've identified where the intermediates are. The intermediates are the chlorine atom and the carbon radical. And if I go to the termination step, the termination steps are the combining of those, basically those intermediates together to form either product, starting material in the case of chlorine, or a brand new product, namely ethane. But there are no transition states that I've shown you yet in this diagram. So now let's talk about the transition states. How would I write the structure of a transition state? Well, let's take chlorine, for example. When I dissociate chlorine, molecular chlorine, to form two chlorine atoms, what am I doing? I'm breaking the bond. So what would be the intermediate of this process? So in other words, on our reaction coordinate diagram, I'm going to go from chlorine molecules through the transition state down to two chlorine atoms. So what's this transition state going to look like? Well, what's in between? What's the sort of average between reactants and products? Well, if I look at this, I've got a chlorine-chlorine bond, and I've got no chlorine-chlorine bond. So what's happening? I'm breaking the chlorine-chlorine bond to form two chlorine atoms. So the transition state is going to be when this bond is partially broken. Okay, that's going to be the that's going to be how we represent the transition state or what the transition state represents. How am I going to represent that? How did I do it in resonance hybrids? Because I can think of it this way. I can say, you know, my transition state's going to have a partial chlorine-chlorine bond. How do I write a partial chlorine-chlorine bond? Exactly like I did in the resonance hybrids. I use a dotted line. Now, usually for transition states, I put them in brackets, and I use this double dagger, which indicates that they are a transition state. So it turns out that when we write transition states, we're going to, in essence, average the reactants and the products together to write the structure of that. So what I'm trying to do here is to relate it to what you did when you wrote resonance hybrids. If you don't remember how you wrote resonance hybrids, then I guess the, that isn't going to work. But that's what we're doing. So this high energy species here is when the chlorine atoms are breaking apart. Kind of makes sense. Now, what would be the transition state in the termination step when the two chlorine atoms come together. 
to form a chlorine molecule. It's exactly the same because two chlorine atoms coming together are going to have to go through that same high energy species. They're going to have to go in this direction. They're going to have to undergo that same high energy species in order to get down here to the chlorine gas molecule. So it would be the same transition state for breaking the bond as it is for forming the bond. So that would be the transition state for the initiation step of the mechanism. Okay. If you think you got that, then now let's go to the first propagation step and say, what is the transition state for this? And I'm going to leave the lone pairs off the chlorine because for the most part we don't write the lone pairs in our transition states. So what would be the transition state for this react uh, for this react no what am I doing for this reaction okay this is the second actual this is the second propagation step we'll go back to the first one here in a moment can you write the transition state for the second step should probably start with the simpler one which is this, the first propagation step. Can we write the transition states for both of these steps? If you think you can do it, stop the tape and write them out. If not, how would we do this? Let's start with the bottom one first. What would be the average between reactants and products in this reaction? Well, I have a chlorine with no bond, and then over here I got a chlorine-hydrogen bond. Over here in the, pro in the reactants I got a, that carbon-hydrogen bond, and over here I got no carbon-hydrogen bond. So what would, the tr what would the transition state look like? Well, in the transition state, what am I doing? I'm forming a chlorine-hydrogen bond, and I am breaking the carbon-hydrogen bond. And so I indicate that by two dotted lines. So here's my transition state. I'm breaking the chlorine-hydrogen, or I'm forming a chlorine-hydrogen bond, and I'm breaking the carbon-hydrogen bond. And that would be our transition state for that step. Okay? Can you write it for this one? Same thing. I'm forming a carbon-chlorine bond, and I'm breaking the chlorine-chlorine bond. And so there is my transition state. Okay, so we have one transition state for every mechanistic step. And that transition state comes about because of the bond breaking and the bond making for that step. Now, could you go back to the termination steps and write those transition states? What would it be for the first step? Well, we've already written it for the first step, right? We got a partial chlorine-chlorine bond. What about the second step? I've got a chlorine forming a bond with a carbon. That would be my transition state. And then for the third step, here's my transition state the formation of the carbon-carbon bond. So I know this is a lot, 
This is a lot for a simple reaction of replacing a hydrogen with a chlorine, but this is the kind of gory detail that we have to get into. Okay. So, initiation step. Chlorine atoms break apart to form chlorine atom, or chlorine molecules break apart to form chlorine atoms. Propagation step. The chlorine radical or atom reacts with the carbon hydrogen bond, it actually does something called abstracts the hydrogen to then form the carbon radical. The carbon radical reacts with the chlorine intact chlorine gas to produce the carbon chlorine bond to form the alkyl halide and another chlorine atom which then goes and wrecks havoc on the system by doing another reaction. This process stops when you run out of stuff or when two chlorine atoms combine, a chlorine and a methyl combine, or the two methyl radicals combine in a coupling reaction. And the transition states for each step are either forming, make, uh, forming breaking, or both forming and breaking the bond and those represented by dotted lines. Now, if you're thinking about in the resonance hybrids, we also average not only bonds but charges. This reaction has no formal charges, therefore there's nothing to average. All of these are just straight um, these reactions just are all involving neutral species. So we talked about these the different features then of the mechanism in terms of the transition states, the intermediates, and the six steps that we're going to have for free radical halogenation. The last topic that I want to sort of introduce to you is what exactly is the structure of this carbon radical? Because that's going to become important as we talk about the reaction itself. And so if you have this methyl radical what, high, what is the geometry around the carbon and how is that going to play a role in the overall stability of this carbon radical? And instead of asking you what the structure looks like, let me tell you what the hybridization of this carbon is found to be. It's found to be sp2. So that means my carbon has the three sp2 hybrid orbitals that are forming sigma bonds to the hydrogen. Okay, so there's my sp2s sigma bond. Then I have the unhybridized p orbital, and it turns out that that's where the unpaired electron sits, is in that unhybridized p. So this is the structure of a carbon radical. And it turns out that depending on how many alkyl groups are attached to that carbon, you can make this radical more or less stable. Now, how would you do that? Well, let's take and add a methyl group to the carbon radical. What effect would you have of adding a methyl group to the carbon radical? Would it make the radical more or less stable? Well, let's look at it from a strictly electronegativity argument. What do I mean by that? Well, if carbon has an electronegativity of 2.4 and hydrogen has a 2.1, we've said that this is a Pol, a relatively nonpolar covalent bond, but it does have some polar character to it, some polar covalent character, a little bit. 
which means this carbon becomes slightly negative at the expense of these hydrogens. Well, when you place an alkyl group on a carbon radical, this carbon then has a little, electro, a little electron density that can now push towards this carbon radical center. Remember, this carbon radical has seven valence electrons. It would love to get to eight. Now, short of it picking up an electron, if this carbon can push a little bit of electron density towards this carbon through what we'll later on call induction, and it picked up the little bit of elect a little bit of delta minus charge from the hydrogens, if it can push that electron density towards this carbon, then what'll happen is that it'll get this carbon a little bit closer to eight. Okay, maybe 7.1, I don't know, it'll, but it'll get it closer to 8. Well, what that leads to is the idea that the more, carb, the more alkyl groups you attach to your radical, the more stable the, the radical becomes, because if I now was to add two methyl groups to that carbon radical, then that means that the delta minus carbons would now, there'd be two of them, and they would be able to push a little bit more electron density towards the carbon radical center and get it closer to 8. It'll never get it totally to 8, but it'll get it closer to 8. And then for, if we put three carbon, three methyl groups on that carbon radical, which is the most I can put on there. I'm now going to put the, push the maximum amount of electron density towards that carbon radical center that I can muster. So that's going to get as close to 8 as it's going to come. Well, I'm going to classify this radical that has one carbon attached to it as a primary radical. Guess what this one's going to be called? A secondary radical. Guess what this one's going to be called? A tertiary radical. And it turns out that in terms of radical stability, a tertiary radical is more stable than a secondary radical, which is more stable than a primary radical, which is more stable than a methyl radical that's got no alkyl groups to help stabilize it. Okay. So this is how we can make this argument based on just simply electronegativity, this carbon picking up some extra electron density at the expense of the hydrogens and pushing it towards the radical center, raising the electron density from 7 to something closer to 8. The more alkyl groups, the more it pushes electron density and gets it closer to 8 and makes that radical center more stable. Now there is another term for this and another way to look at this, which is the last thing that I will leave you with, which is called hyperconjugation. We will learn second semester about conjugation, and conjugation basically is when you have parallel p orbitals that are going to be able to push electron density towards each other. Not overlap in a, like a pi bond, but simply push electron density towards each other. So hyperconjugation would look like this. Let's say I have my radical center with my three groups attached. And now I'm going to attach my carbon of my attached methyl group. Okay, so I've attached one methyl group to my primary carbon radical, or my secondary carbon radical. Hyperconjugation it means this. How does this carbon really kind of push the electron density towards this carbon? Well, one way to look at this is to say that the sp3 orbital aligns itself parallel to that 
carbon radical p orbital. And so when you have these orbitals that are parallel, that means that it can go ahead and it can push a little bit of electron density into that orbital. And so this isn't truly conjugation where you have parallel p orbitals that are pushing electron density, but you have an, a hybrid orbital that can sort of push electron density towards that p orbital. So this is kind of the way we look at the over the way the orbitals push electron density that kind of fits this basic picture of the pushing of electron density. Okay. And so that's what's called hyperconjugation. And of course, the more alkyl groups you attach to the radical center, the more hyperconjugation you get, and therefore the more stable the radical. Okay. So these are the basics that we're going to need to know to study the mechanism of this free radical reaction in gory detail. We need to first of all know the difference between an intermediate and a transition state. How to write the transition states. What it means where they're found on the energy coordinate diagram. The six steps of free radical halogenation. Initiation, propagation, and termination. And then finally, the structure of this sp2 hybridized carbon intermediate, this radical, how do we make that radical more stable? What makes it less stable? Okay. And so once we have those fundamental basics down, then we can go ahead and talk about chlorination, change the chlorine to a bromine, and also talk about what happens when we start having molecules like propane that I'm going to react with chlorine gas. If I'm going to substitute one of these hydrogens for a chlorine, which one is it going to be? Is it going to be this one of these CH3s? Is it going to be this CH2? Is it going to be one of those CH3s? And so to get to the real details, we need to know those fundamental basics. And so that's the purpose of what I've talked about here. Okay. So the online quiz for this, since uh, you'll be watching this before Monday over the weekend or on Friday, the quiz um, will be available probably on Friday. And then you can go ahead and um, take it after you've watched this lecture.